Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Tennis Channel Inside In. We're on the Tennis Channel Podcast Network, Mitch Michael, Santa Monica Studios. The final stages of the 2024 Australian Open are upon us. Joining me now, he's the host of the Monday Match Analysis Podcast, three podcasts as well. Uh, he's on TC's, Air- TC's Airwaves quite a bit uh, and a recurring guest, of course, on this show. I would say most importantly, but the other accolades probably trump that. But Gil Gross back again. Gil from his home studio with his you know, home uh, logo on his microphone. So, Gil, thanks for joining the show. You like that touch? I do. Mitch, always a pleasure. Uh, great honor to be a returning guest. And that set the top of my CV. So don't have no doubts about that. I know we're both kind of, I mean, I wouldn't say we're loopy, but a little sleep deprived. It's been a fun uh, fortnight in Australia and we're, you know, we're experiencing, experiencing it on the West coast here in California, but you know, the action has been tremendous. There's been storylines, plot twists, and we're going to get right to the meat of it. The men's semifinals are today as you're listening to this. So, you know, quick show, quick turnaround. We want to get you guys out there listening and watching all prep for the matches. And we'll start with how they got there. Uh, Novak Djokovic beat Taylor Fritz. Djokovic is going for his 11th record-extending Australian Open singles title. Just, you know, a slew of accolades that are too much to get to. But the match against Fritz that went four sets it was very competitive. And we talk about this all the time, Gil, how scorelines don't tell the whole story. I wanted to give props to Taylor Fritz because that was far and away the best level he's ever showed against Novak Djokovic. But it shows you just how special Novak can be that he's able to take someone's best punch, overcome the adversity of not breaking for his first 15 tries. And yet here he is still in the semifinals moving on. Yeah, I mean, the first two sets, Fritz should take so much away from that because he was right there. It is by far the most inventive he's ever been against Novak. And that's kind of what I was looking for coming into the match. It's like Taylor is someone who has a lot of confidence in his strengths. And that's, that's a good thing. Like, you want that. But I think in previous matchups against Novak, he struggled to really try to innovate and the mindset hasn't been, well, let me change my game because I'm up against somebody who is a very, very special opponent. I think it's been, I'm going to go out there and play my game. This is the first time I saw him incorporate some other things, particularly if I had to say one, it's the forehand drop shot. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I'm going to use this tool way more than I ever use it because I know that Djokovic is going to require a little something extra. And then with the clutch serving and the way he saved those break points in the first two sets where, Mitch, you mentioned the 0 for 15. They were all impressively saved by Fritz. Not all, but almost almost all. Yet, Novak sets three, set four. He was so dominant with his serve and return. I mean, he really did shut the door impressively. Yeah, and, and I, I look at Djokovic, too, and maybe one of his most special qualities is his ability to hit that reset, take that deep breath. I know he's a very spiritual guy in a lot of ways, but set two happens. You could see him take a deep breath. Okay, new set, new challenge. Serving got better. Couldn't have gotten any worse earlier on the first serve, to be honest. But you know his True. ability to play, to play shorter points, and I think part of it is you know, his ability as a chameleon, right? Because Fritz winning longer rallies, Djokovic, the older fighter now, the older guy now, is relying on serves and shortening the rallies and coming the net, and you know a completely different player from Novak Djokovic at age twenty five. But he adjusts and he adapts to his his abilities his body and his opponent on the other side of the net. Totally. It's unbelievable. I mean, first of all, his ace numbers this tournament have been really, really impressive. I crunched the numbers for three and four against Fritz. That ace rate was above 20%. For those who don't follow that stat carefully, that's John Isner range. Mm. I also noticed that Ben Shelton played Adrian Manorino. Novak Djokovic played Adrian Manorino. And Novak had one fewer ace on 130 fewer serves. I get the roof was closed for that match. I get it was indoors. Shelton was in the wind. I don't care. That speaks volumes about Novak's spot serving that at the end of a match, he can actually hit aces at a higher rate than a guy in Ben Shelton who's pumping 135. Yeah, and that's a very good point to consider. I know there were the conditions side. He's not going to have, I mean, he's going to be out in the sun a little bit today. And I guess that's a question for you as well. Do you think these conditions, you know, the heat's going to affect everyone differently, but do you think the conditions were part of why we didn't see, I know he's graded on a curve unlike anybody else, but that pristine Novak Djokovic? Yeah, hundred percent. There were moments in the second set where it was just a very low energy Novak. And you know, if he was under the lights in 65 degrees, we're not getting low energy Novak. 
So I do think that's a big thing. I don't know. But also, I think it helps. The weird thing about this year's Australian Open is that was like the first hot day that Djokovic played in. I think the other side of the draw had a hot day, but it was a cooler than usual Australian Open. And then I think that first day where it hits you and you're not used to it, that's the most dangerous moment. But you look at how Djokovic played when the sun went down and it cooled down a little bit, and it was it was a little bit different. It was higher level. So I think that is a factor. Yeah, I like it. I like that stuff. It's like you got Novak Dayman versus Nightman. It's like two different persons. <laughs> Alcaraz Cincinnati, <laughs> right? That final was unreal. You just got to survive and stay in the fight. And I'm with you with Fritz. If he can keep this going, his, and I don't mean from the baseline, but also that, like his baseline, base level game is so good. You see why he's the top ranked American. You just want him to take more away and the confidence has always been there. So that's what we like to see uh, his opponent. And we'll get to the previews at the end of this podcast, but he's going to be playing Yannick Sinner. Another straight set win this tournament has not dropped the set beats Andre Rublev again in a major quarterfinal. And in this, in this, in this specific match, you know, what a lot of people are going to talk about myself included, or that is that second set tie break five, one Rublev's up center, six straight points. And you could see the moment on both players faces when they knew this match is pretty much tailing down. Center is just so locked in right now. The ball striking has always been there, but I'm seeing Gil, and I'm sure you're seeing it better than I am, real tactical adjustments being made by the Italian. And he has the ability to win matches in multiple ways because the skill development has been insane. If you kind of go, go through it, right, you put him next to Novak Djokovic. I think the one thing that was there early in his career was, okay, he's got a great forehand and he's got a great backhand, especially when it comes to the power. But you would have said the serving, not quite there. Movement, not quite there. Variety, not quite there. And now all those things are right there. So how do you attack Yannick Sinner? What's the hole? What's the weakness? That has actually become a question that's hard to answer with him. And that's a common thread with all the top players. If you're going to be a top player, you need to be someone who you look at and it's like, hmm, where do they lack? Where are they not elite? And that's, that's kind of the difference, I think, between a lot of the, the tier two guys, take a Tsitsipas, take a Rublev, and then yeah. the tier one guys where it's like, wait, what's the plan here? I think Sinner has reached that level. Yeah, and I would just add to that too. And, you know, we'll get to Alcraz in a little bit, but it's, it's really hard to serve him off the court too. And that's been the issue with this matchup with Rublev and Sinner is Rublev's made strides. We know how much of a fighter he is, but second serve doesn't do many favorites when you're playing a guy like Yannick Sinner who has that belief now. This does feel, and we'll see tonight how this match goes, but it feels like a real moment, a real breakthrough for somebody that has been building to this point. You mentioned the skill development and the mindset and everything there. Uh, he's been holding up physically, and the easiest way to do that, Gil, is to just not play long matches. Crushing everybody, yet to drop a set. Do we want to save? Because I, I think you're, it, yeah. okay, yeah, you're hinting towards something that I want to talk about, but we'll save it. Yeah. We're going to get to that match, too, because I just want to give props to and Andre Rublev. I know that number is 0-10 in quarterfinals, and it's Tough. unfortunate. And look, we can look at it both ways, right? Like, it hasn't happened for him. There's talk about tennis ceilings, and Rublev appears to be at his. You can look at who he's played, though, and, like, I would say, other than Tiafo at the U.S. Open that had, you know, the crowd full-on against him, he's run into better players, and that's just kind of how sometimes the sport works. There's one more. There's Chilich at Roland Garros. But That's the, th true. Okay. the thing is about that, he wasn't fully ready mentally, I think, at that point. I think since the start of last year, he's been better mentally in these matches, and he's actually kind of playing at least close to his best. And you're right. He hasn't had the draw open up like it did at those two events since the start of last year. I think the next time the draw gives him opportunity, he's going to take it. I, I really believe that. Yeah, that's so much of a part of what it is, right? Like what quarter you're in, what section you're in. He beats Demon Hour. He has some wins moving on in this tournament, but he runs into arguably the hottest player in tennis outside of maybe Novak Djokovic. So that is one semifinal set. The other side of this draw, Gil, got to talk about the upset. Alexander Zverev took out Carlos Alcaraz, the final of the quarterfinal matches to be played. Four sets, could have been three. Alcaraz starving off elimination in that third set, coming back from a breakdown a mini break in the tie break, but it was Verev back again at the elite level, serving well. But there's so much more to his game going. You could speak to that too about how he's moving well. He's staying in the rallies and he's looking, dare I say, as elite as ever. 
Yeah, I think every part of his game has been clicking all tournament long, except his forehand has been awful. And that's why he had trouble against Cam Nori. He arguably should have lost to Lucas Klein. The forehand just wasn't, it, it wasn't doing mm-hmm. the job. Uh, and then he comes out against Alcaraz, totally different forehand. There's an offensive down-the-line threat. There's depth on the cross-court forehand, which he was really lacking the entire tournament. I think there are a lot of factors for that. When you're playing Alcaraz, you can't really get passive because uh, you just know he's going to obliterate you if you drop the ball yeah. short. And also, Alcaraz was giving him plenty of pace, where I think some of these other guys, not Lucas Klein, but some of these other guys were slow-balling him to his forehand, which is a good tactic. Medvedev will do it, probably. Uh, Zverev played so lights out. The first serve percentage thing, while it is a statistical anomaly that he served 85%, he's also, if you're going to tell me someone's going to serve 85% and average 125-ish miles per hour in a major quarterfinal, who's it going to be? I'd tell you Alexander Zverev is the guy. <laughs> he's the only person who can do that. He he serves above 70% on average, which is yeah. remarkable. So. Yeah, the, the movement and the fitness uh, has been really impressive. Like, I, I thought he would be lacking for fitness against Alcaraz in that quarterfinal. And then we also saw, last thing is the mental game. While, yeah, he got tight. He got nervous trying to close. Also, like, how resilient and tenacious is he just to go right back to work in that fourth set to break in the opening game and, and set the tone? Yeah, it is a little tragic, right, that the only time he's ever blown a two sets to love lead happened at a match that we all remember somewhat fondly, that U.S. Open final. So <laughs> I say that not to bring up old wounds, but to say that he's usually, he is lights out when he gets that lead, even if he does drop a set, he can push the reset button and get there. It's something about him too, right, because he's ranked about where we think he is in the hierarchy of the game, but yet I would say for the guys in that, you call it tier two, we can say just outside the top four or five, He's maybe the most lively to pull these upsets. I think looking at it from 20,000 feet, Gil, we're not surprised that he can beat any top player on any given day. I mean, he's got so many great wins. Now, most of them are in best of three is the thing. He's got big wins over Alcaraz in best of five. That's for sure. Sinner, last year's U.S. Open. Sinner at last year's U.S. Open was the other one. Uh It hasn't happened against Novak. And uh, hey, I mean, he... Him and him and Medvedev have played a million times, but they've never played at a major. So that that adds to the intrigue here. So I want to also say something, Carlos Alcaraz fans. I'm not trying to go to war with you. So this is all said with love and endearingness. And it's a question: twelve majors played, two major titles, a great success rate. But does he have issues, Gil, from what you're seeing with making adjustments, with maybe going to Plan B when Plan A is not working? Because we've seen. You know, this was a similar script, similar book to the Medvedev match at the U.S. Open. Do you think he can improve areas mid-match, in-match, with adjustments being made or, in his case, not made? Yeah, it's, it's tough to say. I mean, I, I actually just don't think he is the clearest thinker and the most disciplined guy on court in terms of his decision-making. I don't know if that's so much about mid-match adjustments. I think there's a level of calmness and nerve management that he needs to start to achieve in big matches. And that's kind of lacking. There were a lot of decisions in that match that, that were just foggy headed. And it's not about a a tactical adjustment there. It's just be smart, right? Be smart is not, it's not a mid-match adjustment. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, I mean, there are things in terms of, you know, return position and, and those things where he does lean quite heavily on Juan Carlos Ferrero who is not in his box because he's recovering from knee surgery. So that is going to be a discussion, a, a, a bit of a question mark. At the same time, he's had success without JCF in his box. And I think that there were a lot of like heat of the moment decisions that no matter who his coach was in his box, it wouldn't have been any better. So look, Alcaraz, I think upstairs in the head, there are parts of his mental game that are great awesome effort. He loves the game and that those things are really, really important, but the decision-making it still is reminiscent of a player who's 20 years old. Right. And we assume, uh, expect it to get a little better, a little crisper, but Hey, you know what? It's another credit to the guy on the other side of the net. Zverev was making him play, making him play tough. I think the next evolution in mid-match coaching and stuff will be, there'll be like a hologram of Juan Carlos Ferrero or <laughs> there. 
to give him adjustments. But no, it was a, a special match for Zverev. He wins, and his opponent in the other semifinal will be Daniil Medvedev. He beat TB Hercosh in five sets. And want to just get to this first and foremost, Gil. It was a masterclass for me as a fan watching this and a top player just finding a way to win. We both saw the same thing after set four. Medvedev was gassed. His legs were cooked. QB was playing stronger. Medvedev had been up till you know, 7 a.m., all the hours on court, all that stuff, and yet he just found a way. He relied on his serve. He exp- expended just the right amount of energy when he needed to, and he's shaking hands the winner in that match. That was you know, the epitome of why top guys are top guys, winning a match like that. It was crazy. It was awesome. I, I really ate up the conclusion of that match because it was, it was very dramatic in the sense you saw a physical recovery that needed to happen, and a lot of things needed to happen. What ended up occurring is Medvedev didn't really move for 30 minutes, and he got a second wind. I'm counting about eight minutes, which is the break in between sets, set four and five, in which he accentuated by having a long conversation with the chair umpire before he went off. He knew what he was doing. I'm with it, you there. He knew what he was doing. <laughs> Classic stall tactic. Exactly. And, and look, that's, I can't blame him. That's what you should do. And it's up to the chair umpire to enforce that kind of thing. And then his serve went nuclear. And Hercotch is not the best returner in the world. He couldn't make the returns to make Medvedev work. And then he, he did get a little bit tight, which is typical when you're playing an injured opponent in a fifth set. Hercotch, also, you might forget because Hercotch has accomplished so much at the Masters 1000 level. Not the case at slams. And then lastly, Mitch, he was coming forward towards the end. He said, you know, when he was playing against the wind, he didn't feel like he could really finish from the back. And obviously, he didn't have the legs to get into these long rallies. So he's like, I got to come forward. And he did it. It was very 2019-like when I used to see Medvedev do that kind of stuff more. The, the fearless stuff that was maybe surprising and a little bit more out of the box for him. And uh, he came through with his volleys. I, I, I don't think like, oh, he fixed his volleys. He's a good volleyer now. But at the end of the day, he was confident. He committed. And he's still a talented tennis player who can make a volley. Yeah, it reminded me of, to, you know, compare other sports, like with football, he was disguising his coverages a little bit. Okay, we're going to stand here. I'm going to mix up tactically. I'm going to try to do whatever I can to throw off the opponent. And for Hubie, yeah, it was maybe the perfect storm on Medvedev's side, a guy who's not, you know, built to take advantage of an injured opponent like that. Um, again, and, and you mentioned with Hubie, like, this is the, I think he hadn't even gotten past the second round in a hard court slam before. So hopefully this works wonders for his confidence and what he can do. But Medvedev just, Finding a way to win these matches and continuing to, I guess, rest up will be the issue for him. But this has been a place of, you know, I know he's had heartbreak in the final, but he's been very successful. He's always successful on hard courts, and Australia has been no different. He just finds a way to collect match wins in hard court slams. He does. This is his third year in the semifinals in the last four editions, and he made the final back-to-back years uh, two years ago. So, yeah, a good history building up. For Daniel Medvedev, no doubt. All right, more with Gil Gross here on Tennis Channel Inside In. We're going to preview the men's semifinals in a bit, but right now, talking about the women's action, we're down to the final round. And uh, we got a couple interesting matches last night as we record this, starting with the headliner, the two highest seeds remaining. Arena Sabalenka avenges her loss to Coco Golf at the U.S. Open. She wins in straight sets. And right off the bat, Gil, I thought you nailed it on, uh, on Twitter X. It was, uh, a good, a great match doesn't always have to be a three-setter. This was a great match. Toko brought it. She continued to fight. Sabalenka just getting past those mental hiccups, resetting herself, showing the growth she's had physically and mentally, gets it done and gets it done in straights. 100% great mental match from Sabalenka. There was a blown lead in the first set where I do think she changed a little bit as a player in that service game. But I think after that, it was tremendous. The tiebreak was a, a display of firepower that I don't think Coco could have done much about. Sabalenka served incredibly well. 76% first serves in. Historically, Mitch, if you look at the matchup between Goff and Sabalenka, Arena's first serve percentage is a barometer for what's going to happen in the match. And I'm not saying, you know, correlation, causation, we understand that it's not that simple, but that has been the trend. So she served very well. 
And look, at the U.S. Open, Coco could rely on her defense and her athleticism, make a couple balls extra, and Sabalenka was going to miss. And that just wasn't happening here. Coco no. recognized that. Coco was more offensive. But a combination of factors, um, and I, I also think it should be said, good break for Arena that the roof was closed, bad break for Coco that the roof was closed. But Sabalenka just wasn't going to hand this over with no. ground stroke unforced errors. It wasn't going to happen. This is her happy place. You know, we've seen it time and time again that she just loves to be out there. And yeah, it was like the serve. We, it wasn't that long ago, a couple of years ago. Sabalenka's serve was the biggest talking point in tennis. How much of a disaster it was in the first set. You could say that for Coco too. She has gotten better, but not at the level where Sabalenka is now, where she was booming in first serves. Smart tactically. I noticed some of the free cuts she took on second serves of Coco's were just right at her, not going for winners off the rip. And yeah, you hit the nail on the head. A smart tiebreaker, an efficient tiebreaker played. We know about the physical progress. We know what Sabalenka can do. But she's proven that she's more than just a quote-unquote ball basher. She does come to net. She does mix up strategies. Coco gave her a great effort. It was, as she said, too, it was a better match she played than the U.S. Open. The U.S. Open was more of a rock fight. This was higher-level tennis, and Sabalenka won more than Coco lost. Yeah, and she came out with a, an, inter an interesting plan to come forward. I think the mindset was, Goff is really, you know, she's so fast, I need to finish points at net. It's a requirement. Now, the volley execution, it was lacking. But you know what? I like the mentality. I like the mindset. And I think just being ready to play that extra ball, I think that ultimately helped her. And for Coco, you mentioned the second serves. I think that was probably the worst part of Coco's game. I'd say Goff was was firing in, in almost, you know, I think the forehand, for example, you could say at 6-5, it, it had a little bit of a hiccup. But other, I think 90% of the match, Goff's forehand was good. Second serve hurt her because she hit five double faults on the first eight second serves. And then for mm -hmm. the rest of the match, she didn't double fault as much, but there were some slow ones that Sabalenka is just going to eat up. And Arena, as you mentioned, Mitch did a really good job doing that. So I felt that that was the one area, technically, where, where Coco had a bit of an off night. Other than that, really high-quality match. And we know Coco's going to be here for a long time coming, playing her last slam as, as a teenager, her place in the game secure within that top five. Sabalenka now, it's uh, three straight hardcourt major finals. She's made the semis in six straight. She's been the most consistent player, which, again, I kind of chuckle at because a few years ago we were like, what is wrong with this girl with all the talent in the world? But people can change. That's what we learned. Uh, she will be facing uh, Zhang Kunwen in the final. She beats Diana Yastremska. First major final for her, second for a Chinese player after Li Na. Li Na who won this title 10 years ago. And uh, Kunwen with the, with the win. And in her run to this major final, not having to go through seeded players, but showing which you've been on top of Gil for a while. The game has been there. The potential has been there. This feels like a earlier than expected arrival for what we would probably agree with. It will be a perennial top 10 player. Yeah, exactly. Like there are two parts of this. There is one. I think she's going to be here again. Um, the talent is slam contender level talent. At the same time, I think she's really kind of early in her development. There are a lot of things that are likely to get a lot better. I mean, she's, she uh, leads the, the field in aces, but to me that serve can get is going to get 15, 20% better potentially. And I think the, the shot selection, the decision-making is another thing where I think she'll follow a similar arc as Sabalenka and just start to, she'll always, you know, I think she'll always be an aggressive player and she should, mm -hmm. but I think it will refine itself a little bit more as she progresses. So I think the comparison that I want to make is uh, Rybakina at Wimbledon in, in 2021, where, or was 2022 rather, uh, where Rybakina was the number 17 seed and she, she hadn't really gone on a run like this ever before. But at the same time, I think everybody understood, oh, that, that was in her. Maybe she's ahead of schedule, but mm -hmm. We're not going to look back at this as a surprising slam, in this case, champion. And for Zhang Kiwen, it'll either be finalist or champion. I think five years from now, we'll be like, oh, yeah, that was early on, but it makes total sense that she was able to do this. 
She has real weapons out there, which is half the battle. The other side of it is the defense because Yastrzemska brought it. Her ability to hit on both wings has been exceptional. We've kind of known Gil Wright. Yastrzemska has some power and some game in there. It's been a little rough around the edges, but this match was, again, straight sets, not as straightforward as it was, you know, looking at the scoreline. I think, I think the ability to defend is so important at this level because we're getting to a point now where, and I've, I've talked to former players about this, the players are getting bigger, they're getting stronger, and you think, oh, you just got to just hit them off the court. But that's not exactly how it works. I would say top-level defense has been the noticeable improvement I've seen across the board because you have no other choice when you face these ball strikers. The key is that now, now there's both. I mean, you look at Sabalenka, let's talk about her. Is her movement underrated or is her movement underrated? Yeah, yes. I mean, she, <laughs> I mean she's, a, she's a really, really great athlete, and it reminds me a lot of Zhang Kim Wen. It's like, who's a better mover? I'm going to do a deep cut. I'm sorry, but like Zhang Kim yeah. Wen or Marie Bozhkova? No, Bozhkova is a better mover. But the thing is, Zhang Kim Wen can, can hang, and she has good uh-huh. lateral movement. Uh, and that, that is the new thing where you're a power player who can scoot around the court at a pretty high level. That's everything. And, and when I say can't miss potential or slam contendership potential, that's really what I'm looking at, Mitch. How hard do you hit the ball and how fast do you move around the court? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty simple when you break it down like that. I just never thought, and I've talked to some people about this too, you know, two big girls hitting the ball is an exciting match. It's not just standing on the baseline and throwing. They're mixing in movement. When we're back in a place, Sabalenka, it's always exciting. And now I'm, I'm expecting the same thing with Quinn Wen here. Uh, she is a pretty big underdog here. And I think, I think there's a popular school of thought here. And I would necessarily, I would agree with a lot of it, Gil, that this is Sabalenka's time to win this major. She probably handles her nerve. If she handles her nerves, she probably will win this one. But you never know. It is just one match. And you know that Having seen Quinn Wen play matches, she is a fighter. She's taken sets off great players before and pushed them to the max. But it does feel like Sabalenka's time to go back to back. Yeah, look, I I think it could go either way. I got to be sure. honest. Uh, I mean, Sabalenka last year, I think the story of her year at majors was when you think she's over the hump, when you think that she is completely kind of all the nerve management issues are in the past. They just pop up again. Yeah. Yeah. Like, look, I I was so shocked at what happened at Roland Garros. I thought the Australian Open title was going to change it forever. And that's just not how it worked. So I I go back to, again, Wimbledon 2022, Rybakina. Anshapur, it was her time. It was Anshapur's time to win Wimbledon that year against Rybakina. I I hear that, and I, I understand it completely. I do think, though, this might be a special place for her. And I think we're getting back to an era. You know, the unicorns are almost gone. Djokovic is the last one where we might be going. We might have to look at this on a tournament by tournament basis, case by case. So in Australia, Sablanka seems like she's money, but you, make, you add Claire Grass to the mix or the U.S. crowd, maybe then, okay, we're, we're taking the gloves off and the nerves come back. I, I totally maybe. agree. I totally agree. I mean, she's lost one set in Australia in the last, uh, what, thir- 13 matches, I think. No. So... That does give you a certain comfort, calmness, confidence that there has to be something to be said for that. And the final first final, too, for Quinn Wynn. So we'll see what that one goes. Uh, men's semifinals tonight. We're going to end with this previewing both matches. Uh, Djokovic Center, the first one. They're back again playing. First time here in a best of five in this tournament. They played at Wimbledon a few times with Djokovic getting the better in those matches. But. Sinners had success, had success down the road, best of three. They were playing each other a bunch, beating each other back and forth. This one's different. Sinners playing exceptional tennis, has not dropped a set, Gil, but he's playing the greatest of all time, going for title number 11 in his favorite slam. So how do you assess this one, and what are the keys to victory for both? The interesting thing about this match is I think skill for skill, it's hard to say, well, here's where Djokovic separates himself, or here's where Sinner separates himself, and that's typical for Novak Djokovic opponents. but. I look at the technical side of this match, and to me, it's very mysterious. I don't know how it's going to play out. It's the mental side, and also, I think, physically. Both of them should be really, really strong, ready to play five. It's the mental side of things where I can get to, I can look at Novak Djokovic, I can get to Novak Djokovic, and I can say, okay, there should be a real advantage there when you're talking about the best player of all time under pressure. 
one of the all-time great problem solvers, one of the all-time great tacticians. Again, somebody in center who, yeah, has started to come through big matches more and more, but ne never a major semifinal, you know, and there's a history of nerve management issues with, with Yannick as well. Uh, but for him, it's just more so what's going to happen if he has a lead in this match? Is it going to be steady? And that's like one of the only things I can find. And let me be very clear. That's a huge compliment to Yannick Sinner because most of the time in a matchup like this, I'm looking at uh, a skill set advantage that Novak Djokovic has. And I'm saying, oh, that might be it. But for Sinner, uh -huh. I do think skill for skill. He can, he can run with Novak. It's uh -huh. kind of the mental thing for me. I mean, uh, what, do you, what do you think about that? I have a sneaking suspicion. I can't wait for this to be time stamped and proven wrong, but I've been thinking about this for the last couple of days. And I feel like this is going to get to a point where Sinner's up two sets to one. And it's going to go to a fourth set. And I'm going to look at it thinking, okay, here's the moment. And can Sinner, can Sinner win this in four or will Djokovic do what he's done, what he did against Dominic team in that Australian open final years ago, just figure out a way to chop him down, find a sliver of an opening serve effectively play the big points. Huge. But I'm with you. I mean, even I thought last year at the end of last year, if you asked Novak Djokovic, who's the best young player between Sinner and Alcaraz, I think he would have said Sinner even before the matches. Like, who's a tougher matchup for him to play? That's the best compliment I could give Sinner is that he is the one guy in this era that has proven that he can match up with Djokovic on a skill for skill basis across the board. Now, having said that, you still have to get to the finish line. You still have to not play tight. As you said, it's nerve management, but it's also managing your body. And that's the one thing. With center, best of fives, Verev last year. What are the elements going to be like? It's going to be during the day, which will slow Novak down. We also assume slow center down. This is just such a fascinating matchup. Like I'm, I'm as excited as ever because I also think Gil Center's at a point where moral victories aren't anything anymore. He's been around long enough. This is the time. This is, I want the torch. You're going to pass it or I'm going to take it. And Novak's obviously has no intention of passing it anytime soon. 100%. Now, also, though, the only thing, yes, I agree, no moral victories, but also experientially, he needs to get into a battle with Novak, best of five in a slam semifinal. That's going to be a good experience. Whether he comes through it and wins it, or if he loses it, it's going to prepare him for the next time. He lacks experience right now, and that's kind of my concern overall. So no matter, no matter what, he's going he's gonna to be better in that area moving forward. Two sets to love against Djokovic in that quarterfinal Wimbledon, and then it was just one-way traffic the other way. So maybe that'll help too, but that's, that's a big one. The other one is Medvedev Zverev. No love lost there. I don't know if you saw it last night, but I, I thought they could steal a page out of the NHL's book. If they get tense, just play John Cena's theme music if they're going at it over the PA. <laughs> but these guys, and it's funny that they haven't played in this setting before. Best of five major stakes on the line. Uh, there are strengths and weaknesses for both, but again, who do you think holds the hammer? And what do you think could be the difference maker in Zvera versus Mevedev tonight? I think physicality. What's crazy about the situation we're in, these guys have both played way too much tennis. I mean, it, it's way too much. It's not a good way to win a major. Now, one of them is going to be in the final and they're going to have a chance to win a major. But both of them are over 16 hours. That's average of <laughs> about three and a half hours per match. And Medvedev certainly didn't look good at the end of the Hurkacz quarterfinal. And I think Zverev did a really good job hiding it and fighting through it. But I don't think he was 100% at the end of the Alcaraz I'm match either. Got issues. Like, and I don't, it might just be bad blisters, which is bad enough. But he, yeah, <laughs> this, is, this is two wounded, wounded animals coming into this match. And uh, the physicality is going to be huge. I will say, though, like Zverev, and I think Medvedev has proven across the board that he is a more accomplished player and has put in all this the last couple of years. But Zverev's serving day is the biggest weapon in the match. Like, if he comes out guns a-blazing, that's the biggest quote-unquote weapon in this one. Yes, I will say Medvedev is probably one of the best equipped players to deal with Zverev's serving style. Zverev's favorite mm -hmm. serve is T, and when you're serving bombs T, there's nobody who's going to just kind of neutralize that as well as Medvedev with the, the deep return position. It's, it's better against him to just hit really good spot serves out wide. And that's not as much Zverev's bread and butter. I will say this, though, in favor of Zverev, physically, I think he's got a way better track record than Medvedev. So if I'm coming into this match thinking this is going to be a, a war of attrition and a battle of endurance, I kind of like Zverev in that area. He's got a 20-11 and 11 record in five setters. He, he's so good at, 
at just surviving physically, where Medvedev, honestly, if you look at his runs deep in majors, usually it's, it's cruise control central. Like when he won the U.S. Open, he lost one set the whole time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, wow. I, I just, this is a great matchup in terms of just personalities clashing, tennis clashing, and what's at stake here for both. Zverev trying to get into the major club and just get to another final would be the bookend of a, of a year where a year ago he's losing to Michael Moe as like half the player that he could be. Yeah. Now he's into the final, potentially. Or Medvedev getting his third crack at a title and trying to get slam number two. We, we could talk about it with Sabalenka. You get that second slam, it's for sure Hall of Fame. Your legacy is secure. And Medvedev has been knocking on the door of that for so long. Yeah, I do think he's already there with Hall of Fame status, I think, compared to a lot of the other one slam winners. Medvedev's mm -hmm. resume is actually... Uh, a little bit, a little bit better, but you're right. Uh, two slams, no matter how you look at it, hall of fame or not completely changes the legacy factor here. And also I, I do think it's of added importance to these guys to win this match, because I think that, as you said, there is no love lost and the head to head, like you can give me 11 to seven, all you want or, or whatever it is. Forget it. When you play at a major, that's the one you want. So it, it, it's, you're right. It's going to be really exciting. Um, I, I agree that Zverev is the better server of the two. I also think Medvedev has a bit of an edge from the baseline. I think he hits his forehand down the line better. The way his ball stays low bothers Zverev a little bit, and he's just more creative and more difficult to read, disruptive from mm -hmm. the baseline in a way where Zverev is a lot more patterned. It's going to be a good one. It's going to be the one worth bragging rights to. Whoever wins this one's going to have the bragging rights. It's the one they're going to look at. Uh, Gil Gross, always a pleasure. Uh, what's, what's new on, on, your, on your neck of the woods? You got more podcasts, more media coming up, and I know some tennis channel broadcasting duties as well. I just wanted to check in on where you're at professionally. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are some exciting things that, that uh, I'm, not, I'm not ready to announce, but maybe next time. Uh-oh, there All it right? is. Yeah, the uh, tools. So, yeah, okay. but I, I will say, I will say uh, Monday Match Analysis on all podcast platforms. Gil Gross is the name of the YouTube channel, and uh, watch plenty of Tennis Channel and T2, and you might just hear me. All right. We're going to do that. We're definitely going to do that. So Gil Gross, pleasure as always on Tennis Channel Inside, and you'll be back for sure soon. 2020, 2024 off to a great start. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Mitch. Always a pleasure.